Hello, and welcome to the Family Histories podcast, the show for and about those of us who are sat quietly in libraries, archives, and spare rooms all around the world, tirelessly piecing together our collective social and family history. My name is Andrew Martin, I'm a family historian, and I'll be your host. In this episode, The Constable, we'll be hearing about my guest's law-enforcing Scottish ancestor who emigrates to New Zealand, and we'll be looking for a 19th century woman in New Zealand whose Scottish parents remain a mystery. So, put down that old trade directory, grab a cuppa, and let's meet our guest. My guest today is a professional genealogist and speaker from New Zealand who encourages us to think about the future of our history. She has also served as both president and treasurer of the New Zealand Society of Genealogists. She's been on the organising team of the Christchurch Family History Expo, and she now heads up Memories in Time. So before she gets bored with my introduction and skips off into the future, let me introduce my guest, Fiona Brooker. Hello, Fiona. Welcome to the Family Histories podcast. Hi, Andrew. Lovely to be here with you. You're very welcome. Uh, Let's start right at the top and find out how on earth did you get interested in researching family history? I'm one of those ones that um, started a very long time ago, Okay, probably encouraged by my mother to an extent in that she started an interest. And I remember sitting at my grandparents' house on the west coast of New Zealand, just outside of Hokitika at a place called Arahura. Mm-hmm. And she was drawing out my family tree for me. Okay. And part of this was because um, somebody in England had written to the vicar in Hokitika looking for descendants of this family that had written letters back to England. Right. That they now had the copies of. Okay. So they had a whole collection of letters that they then transcribed and sent to us. So this is the 1970s. So this is a snail mail and, you know, no instance. It's quite a delay. Yeah, a bit of delay. And the fact that they had to type them all up on the typewriter. <laughs> uh, and we got sent the carbon copy of these letters. And so these letters were written um, starting on the voyage out to New Zealand in 1880 by my ancestors Edmund Thorne and his wife Anna Maria Hill and his um, brother Ernest Thorne. Okay. And they came out to New Zealand on the Durham, arriving in Canterbury. And they settled initially here in Canterbury and then went to the West Coast. And so one of their siblings' descendants in the UK had all of these letters. Wow. Which is just a stunning and so lucky to have these. I guess it was quite a nice insight into how people found or what they thought of New Zealand for them to all be sending these letters back to people that they'd left behind in the UK. It sure was. There was encouragement for others to come out. You know, there was discussion on what the harvest was like in England compared to the work they were doing here in New Zealand because they were working as farm labourers. Mm-hmm. There was the gossipy bits where they're talking about, oh, really, this happened? <laughs> and it would be so fantastic if we had the other half of the letters. Yeah, I bet. To see what was being sent. They talk about receiving newspapers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they talk about the voyage itself and the fact that, you know, the spirits on board were being sold were very expensive, (laughs) but they wished they had some to take the taste away from the water. Uh, So there's little things like that floating in. And then the letters actually go through to the 1920s when those people actually died here in New Zealand. So their children are informing their aunts and uncles. Okay. But there's that also that change in what happens because you have the children obviously being told to write letters to the aunts and uncles <laughs> in the UK that they've never met. They have no connection to them at all, and they'll, but they're obviously going, thank you very much for writing. But one of them goes, I don't really know what to tell you. And I think that's the whole thing about how quickly we can get disconnected from our family history as much as anything else. Yeah. When you're researching for your own family history, what is that like to research in New Zealand, 
And what is it like to research from within New Zealand and you're researching ancestors in England? We sure are. So in New Zealand, um, we have some fantastic resources. Okay. But we also have a lovely thing called a Privacy Act that also restricts some of our resources. So, yeah, it's it's uh, you guys in the UK have it so lucky. We, we <laughs> feel fortunate that for a lot of us, we come from the UK because we can get into other records. But in New Zealand, we have a Privacy Act. Um, it stops us being able to look at, for example, birth indexes for under 100 years old. Gosh. So that can be quite restricting. Wow. Now, before the Act came in, they had published microfiche, and those still existed a lot of libraries, including libraries in the UK. Okay. But they stop in the 1990s. So we're now starting to get to the stage that, you know, we're looking at 30 years that you have total restriction on being able to research living people. And for some families, that's nearly two generations. Yeah. So we're, this is where I get really worried about what's going to happen in the future. I remember sitting in the library, listening to a young girl talking to the librarians about the fact that she didn't know if her mother was alive or dead. Okay. She lived with her father and he had told her that she had died when she was born. But she says, I don't know if I can trust him. I don't know if he's telling me the truth. Yeah. And so the restriction on what records we could actually look and the librarian was trying to help her with was quite huge because the the things that we rely on now just aren't necessarily available. So it's interesting to see that change in how we will be doing family history in the future from that perspective. But then again, for us that are also living in New Zealand, we know we came from somewhere. Yeah. So we also know that with our family history, and I'm talking Pākehā family history here predominantly, we will be heading out of the country relatively quickly. Okay. Um, New Zealand, you know, the mass immigration into New Zealand sort of started in the 1840s, uh, predominantly coming from the UK, although we do have European settlers coming in as well. Sure. So we know that our family history is quickly going to go out of New Zealand. And so that's why you get a huge uptake in the likes of DNA testing. Okay. Uh, New Zealand and Australians are very good at DNA testing because we know we came from somewhere and we're looking to find out where that place is um, and make those connections. But we do have some very good records that tell us good things as well, like our marriage certificates have both parents on them. Ah, okay. Um, (laughs) Quite useful. Mothers Mothers are included. Our death certificates, for example, from 1876 onward, have the parents' names on them if they're known. Okay. So we have good resources. We have a fantastic digitised newspaper collection. Uh, We have fantastic collections of probates that are being digitised and made freely available as well. But sometimes we just get a little bit stuck because we don't have things like census records. Our government decided to destroy all of ours predominantly. Oh, that's not so helpful. Uh, No, it's not so helpful. So we tend to use um, electoral rolls and school records. Right. I was wondering how you work around these kind of data blockers and the bizarre activities of destroying censuses to research when, when you're kind of blocked through one avenue. What kind of routes do you take to get round it? We have this thing in New Zealand called the number eight wire, which basically means we'll use anything and do anything to um, strengthen fences and bits and pieces like that. (laughs) So they call it the number eight wire mentality. Okay. (laughs) And basically we'll work as hard as we can to to find something and, and make it work. So yes, as I say, school records, the New Zealand Society of Genealogists over the years has had a huge... Uh, project to index and transcribe as many school records. And that includes the ones that are in archives, the ones that are still at schools, but also the ones that have been found under beds and in attics of people's houses because maybe the school closed. Schooling was um, 1877 onwards was compulsory as such. So Mm -hmm. they're a huge collection because we have the admission registers that will tell us that these children were admitted to this school on this date. And if you're lucky, it will also tell you where they went. So I knew that I had a family, for example, in my Hannam family, Mm -hmm. that um, had disappeared out of New Zealand. I knew they'd gone because none of them were dying in New Zealand, but I didn't know where. And it was actually through the school registers where a couple of the children are taken out, but it didn't say anything. It just said taken out by the father. Okay. Um, And then, but then they're re-enrolled about four, three weeks later, and it was like, "Hmm, that's interesting. And then they disappear again. 
but this time it goes gone to Australia. Oh. So I think what had happened is Dad had taken the older children with him to Australia. Mum was pregnant at the time. Check it all out, see whether it's a good place to be. Come back, sort out life, but throw the kids back into school because let's face it, who wants the kids at home when you're trying to sort out and pack up your whole life? <laughs> and then took them all away. And so that's the other thing about New Zealand. Because we are an island on the other side of the world, people can come and go and disappear to anywhere else because yeah. we've done that before. Of course. Does New Zealand have any unusual types of records and unusual from say, a British or American point of view? Do they have any that are really unique to New Zealand? Um, I don't know that there's anything that's really unique. We're using a lot of the same type of records that we would use if we were going and doing our research in the UK or, or in America. Probably a, more use of electoral rolls. Um, we were the first country in the world to give women the vote. Okay. So we're talking 1890. Uh, three and, uh, 1892 and 1893, we have lovely things called um, suffrage petitions, uh, which are lots of women signing to say, please give us the vote. <laughs> uh, they're a huge collection. It is a wonderful thing to be able to go and find your ancestor actually signing one of these petitions and saying, do this. Yeah. The women were given the vote in the September. The elections were in the October. They had to extend the enrolment time for women to get themselves enrolled for that election. So it's really cool to see. So we do have a few little things like that floating around that are a little bit different. Here in, in the England and Wales censuses, we often see messages written for people who would like the votes. And obviously there's a lot of women there putting messages into those censuses in the re census returns. But I guess maybe you don't get those messages. Yeah, they, they do tend to cover that. Um, in that we have the records where the woman has signed. Um, okay. And it's an interesting process because although the 1893 um, suffrage petition is the most famous, there was earlier petitions from the early 1890s. In fact, there was more than just the two that I've mentioned. Mm -hmm. The 1892 one, for example, I know my ancestor Anna Maria that came on the ship in the 1880s has signed it from the West Coast, but she doesn't appear to have signed an 1893 one. Okay. But it's not that she necessarily didn't sign one. It could be that that section doesn't exist any longer. Oh, okay. So they may have signed it. It just didn't quite make it to the, the final part of being all pasted together and rolled up into a great big scroll and delivered to Parliament. And that's now kept at our National Library. Sure. Um, obviously, the other big documents that we have, we've also got the Treaty of Waitangi, um, which was signed in the 1840s. And, you know, these are such precious documents. Your genealogy business is called Memories in Time. Does this mean that you're uh, a kind of genealogy futurist looking forwards in time? Uh, I sure do. I think, um, you know, my, my tagline is yesterday's moments, tomorrow's memories. <laughs> and I think we forget that we are part of making history as well. And I think it's really important that we actually record what we're doing. So, you know, we're sitting here having a podcast uh, recording yep. today. You know, we should take a photo of this and actually keep it as part of our history to show we did this. Yeah. The voice part may exist into the future, but who knows what else will happen. Uh, I, I have a talk called The Time Travelling Genealogist that I give, hmm. and it's talking about what happens when we're 50 years in the future with regard to what records we'll have. You know, I'm talking about these letters that I've started my family history with from the 1880s. People don't write letters now. No. They write emails. They write texts. Yep. They write WhatsApp messages and Facebook messages and Instagram messages. There is no archive of all of those messages. You, you change your phone and you lose all your history on something. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to have those as documents to look at. People, because they're so busy Facebooking and Instagramming, they're not necessarily writing diaries. No, that's true. Um, at schools, we used to get school newsletters sent home. I'm a parent. You know, the newsletter would arrive. Here's all the news from school. Hey, we're celebrating your child was in this and won this or did this, etc. Those are now electronic. They come on a, a website or an email or something like that. Are, are the schools archiving them? Do they just disappear off the school computer system? that we won't have. Yeah. Um, I don't know about you in England, but our newspapers now are so small 
and don't have the quantity of local news that we've looked at and had in the past. No, they don't. It, it's syndicated news from around the world. Yeah. And you look at that and go, okay, they're getting smaller. It's all going online as well. Will we have that in the future? So 50 years, we could actually be, although we're creating a lot of data, will we be able to access it? And I guess the, 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 the tagline behind that is, okay, so in 50 years' time or 40 years' time, Mark Zuckerberg decides to run for American president and takes down the whole of Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and says, I can't have it there anymore because it's against the political process, etc. And it's all gone. And it's just scary that we're, we're entering a black hole. So, yes, I do encourage people to actually write. I do encourage people to actually share. Um, we genealogists are very good at collecting. Yeah, definitely. But getting it out there and sharing it with the rest of the family is so important. I noticed from your website that, that you encourage digital scrapbooking. I'm not quite sure what that is. What, can, can you help me? I guess it's a way of sharing. Yeah. It's, my interest in digital scrapbooking actually started with a cookbook. Okay. Uh, my mother had died and passed away, and I had inherited the family cookbook mm -hmm. with you know, the family recipes, the important ones, the ones that are on the pages that are all stained and have all the, you know. The favourites. The favourites. And I wanted to be able to share that with my brother. And so I thought, oh, yeah, I can just photocopy it, but that's not very exciting. What else can I do? Now, scrapbooking had been around a long time, but um, and I'm talking about paper scrapbooking, where you go to the shop and you buy flowers and frames and beautiful pieces of paper. Yeah. And I had resisted scrapbooking because I knew for me, scrapbooking would be very much like fabric. And I have a huge collection of sewing fabric. I did not need a huge collection of scrapbooking papers because <laughs> you don't want to cut them because I know I'm a bit of a perfectionist and it would really upset me if I, you know, cut up a piece of paper and it was wrong. And then I discovered this digital scrapbooking lark and I thought, oh, this is quite good because digital scrapbooking allows you to scrapbook. So I got to do the creative part of the scrapbooking, mm -hmm. but you get to use the papers over and over again. You get to... Uh, just use your digital copies of photos instead of real copies of photos. Yeah. Uh, you can resize, recolor, redo anything, and Control Z is your friend to undo. So I really like this idea. And I discovered a website called Digital Scrapbook Place, um, unfortunately no longer in existence, and got to sort of be involved in it and start doing some of the challenges that they would put up to actually get some scrapbooking done and obviously to sell their product at the time. And as it turned out, the head designer, um, Lauren Baven, actually came from New Zealand. So American website, head designers in New Zealand as well. And so we we started chatting. We ran a few digital scrapbooking workshops in New Zealand. Um, I sort of converted her to family history. Well done. <laughs> and she started creating kits that were great for family history. Uh, so, yeah, there is a range of kits there now that are allowing people to make more decorative books. And one of the things I've been running in the last few years is a program called Plan to Publish with the aim of getting the family history out of the computer and into hands. Mm. And that can range from, hey, we've got some cards that you can just print off and hand write on. And let's face it, handwriting's a treasure in its own right. Yeah, definitely. And I could be a bit of a geek and maybe I do have my handwriting as a font. <laughs> but that is perhaps a little bit geeky. Um, Wow. Okay. Um, but, you know, to actually just typing up something in Word and presenting it and photo books have made it so much more accessible to be able to print, you know, smaller copies, yep. but have those available at a relatively high quality. And I've found a way of sort of doing that with lots of text, which we genealogists are good at, and funny sized documents and things like that, to going the whole hog and actually digitally scrapbooking something so it's taking it from the family history that would sit on your bookshelf possibly pulled out scan through read the bit that you're looking at and put back on that bookshelf to the one that will sit on your coffee table the one that people will pick up and flick through because it's got pictures and color and yeah. more than just text on the pages and the great thing if you're doing it that way also is that you don't have to write screeds you know a hundred words can actually fill a page with a photo. And, you know, everyone can write 100 words, especially by the time you've bullet-pointed it and, you know, 
wrote three sentences and now we'll probably go on to chat GPT and actually take those bullet points and tell it to write the sentences for us. <laughs> so <laughs> things are getting exciting. They are. What do you think the genealogy industry or the genealogy community could do to make itself a better place? Ooh, make itself a better place. That's an interesting question. Um, I think we just need to be out there encouraging more people to just do that, to get it out of the computer um, and to actually remember and talk. I know that we do that already and we say go and talk to the oldest person in the family and things like that, but we need to make it easy for people to go and do that. Yeah, We need to give them the tools to be able to go and do that. Because for some of us, we're, we're quite introverted. We don't actually like picking up the telephone um, and talking to people. You know, we, we wrote letters. Letters, in a way, were a lot safer to, to write a letter to someone and ask questions about their family than that immediacy that we have now of sending an email and someone coming straight back to you and you actually having to have a sort of an active conversation with someone. So I think giving people the tools to be able to do these interviews, to be able to talk, to be able to ask the questions, um, to know what questions to ask, we need to be encouraging that more. Um and especially, as I say, in New Zealand, where we've got privacy laws that stop you getting access to, to some of this information, um, we have a huge immigrant population that are coming from countries um, for good and bad reasons as such, that they are trying to escape something in the past, that we need to be able to give them the tools to be able to go and ask the questions and find out that history. Because just like my ancestors disconnected in the 1880s, they are getting disconnected from their homes, their populations, their stories. Yeah. And they may be coming from countries that don't have the great range of documents that we can go to an archives and collect and get access to. So if we can do more in that, that area, I think that would be huge. When you're researching your family's history, you can stumble across what seemed like ordinary people. But as those clues are unearthed, you realise that they're living remarkable lives. So with this in mind, it's time for my guest to share the life story of one of their most fascinatingly good, bad or just plain ugly relatives. OK, Fiona, who are you going to introduce us to? Well, I thought I might introduce you to the last of my ancestors to actually come to New Zealand. OK. I find the stories of these people that have decided to jump on a boat and come completely to the other side of the world, fascinating. Yeah. And in fact, this ancestor that I want to introduce you to did just that in 1924. Now, Thomas Urquhart was born in Aberdeen in Scotland. Okay. He was a, a variety of things during his life. But I can guarantee you that when he hopped on the ship to come to New Zealand – and he came on a ship called the Ionic. He did not expect to hop on the ship with his wife and children and arrive as a widower oh, no. with just his children with him, coming to this brand new land. So let me tell you a little bit about Thomas. He was born in 1882 in St Nicholas in Scotland, in Aberdeen. He grew up in a family where he was the oldest of the children, of 10 children in fact. Okay. He had younger siblings that would also share that same need to leave to an extent. Um, when I look at his family, he wasn't the first to go uh, and he wasn't the last to go. Well, he might have been the last to go actually. His brother Adam had actually already immigrated to New Zealand before the, his family decided to come. So Adam had come out in about 1905. Okay. We know that he enlisted in the New Zealand um, Army for World War I and actually went back to the UK to serve in Europe. So likely did go back and see his family. And in that chance to see his family, obviously must have said, hey, look, New Zealand's a great place to come to. We th I think you should come and join me out here. I've got a bit of a farm, it's going to be all good, bring the whole family and life will go on. Right, okay. Well, before that had happened for Thomas, um, he was actually a mason working in Aberdeen. But in 1907, 
for some reason, and I have absolutely no idea how one goes from being a mason to suddenly becoming a police constable with the Aberdeen <laughs> Police Force. That's a bit of a change. Uh, but that's what happened on the 25th of March, 1907. Uh, so he joined the police force. Um, he, What was great is that I was able to actually get his records from the police force. I found a nice researcher, wrote and said, hey, I live in New Zealand. I know this guy was in the police force. Okay. And I was sent some beautiful photos of documents that show me the fact that he was 25th of March that he started in. Uh, I know exactly when he was promoted. Okay. I know that he became a second-class constable in 1908 and a first-class constable in 1909, so I can actually follow him through his career. I also know exactly when he was sick <laughs> because it's got all the sick records, so I know he had uh, a sore throat and the flu wow. and sinus infections and a whole host of stuff like that <laughs> that you never think you're ever going to find out about. No, definitely not. But I also found, and, and just so you know, they also have all the, the children's birth dates and marriage dates, which is a really nice little record. But I also know that on the 12th of November, 1918, um, he was drunk on duty. Oh, okay. At 2 a.m. on the state. Whoops. And got himself fined 10 shillings. <laughs> now, I have to say that when you actually consider the date of the 12th of November, 1918, he possibly had a reason for being drunk on duty at 2 a.m. in the morning because I would imagine he was out celebrating with pretty much the whole rest of Aberdeen at the time with the end of World War One. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. If, you, if you're going to do it, that would be a, a good date to do it. Yeah, we might forgive him for that yeah. little sort of problem as he um, got into trouble. <laughs> but this record also tells me that he resigned. He resigned and left the service on the 19th of July, 1924. And by this stage, we'd, we'd got through World War I. His father had actually remarried. Um, his father, in fact, had died in 1922. That's Adam, his father. Mm -hmm. um, his mother had passed away previously. So his family dynamics were changing at home. There wasn't that need to stay there. And as I say, several of his siblings actually immigrated to Canada as well. So I guess there was a choice there that he had. He had the choice of following Adam to New Zealand or following the rest of the family to Canada. So I could have been Canadian. <laughs> um, so it's interesting to see that as well. Now, when I, was, when I was at primary school, we must have had a family history project to do. And I must have asked when they arrived because my granddad was also on this voyage coming out. And my step-grandmother wrote me a letter about the voyage. And it's really cool because I've still got the letter. Wow. It's that pack rat part. Um, and it tells me the fact that they um, left Aberdeen, they went to Edinburgh, and they boarded the Flying Scotsman. Oh, very nice. So they hopped on the Flying Scotsman for London. In style. Yeah, bit of style. It's not bad. He was a, he was a police constable after all, paying for all of this. <laughs> they arrived at the King's Cross station, which for them must have been quite different after living in Aberdeen, yeah. Um, where they had to locate another train to take them to Southampton, where they met their boat, okay, or their ship. Um, the letter for me is in child language, so it took them five weeks and three days to sail to Wellington, arriving here in September 1924, and it politely tells me that during the voyage, your great-grandmother became ill and died on August the 26th and was buried at sea. Yeah. But it also tells me some interesting stuff about the fact that during the voyage it was also really rough, and everyone um, was getting seasick. Oh, no. And they had to put battens across the doors to and across the decks so that people stayed on the ship. Oh, okay. Um, but my granddad, my granddad, Adam Urquhart Jr. as such, um, was really good. He took himself off down to the... Um, the sort of the dining room, and he had bread and butter with jam or honey for meals because they couldn't cook because everything was rolling around on the ship. Yeah, fair enough. Now, when I think about the fact that at this stage my granddad is only um, seven and he's basically seems to be wandering around the ship by himself to have food, <laughs> you sort of go, hmm, that's very brave. Now, what happened on the voyage is there's a couple of things that I've inherited over the time. One um, 
I can tell you there were a group of Masons on board okay. the the voyage, Freemasons, yep. because they had a lodge meeting and a dinner. And I've got the menu from that. So there's really interesting things that you find wow. that are around that maybe you don't even know to look for. But as I say, um, he did arrive a widower because um, his wife, Anne McIntosh Watt, um, had given birth to a stillborn child on the voyage. Uh, that child was buried at sea as well. And then two days later, she collapsed um, with complications from the pregnancy and was also five hours later buried at sea. Now, what's really, really sad is that this was between Australia and New Zealand. I know the exact coordinates where her body was buried. Wow. Um, because very nicely, there was a lovely researcher called Christopher Watts who did some research for me and sent me all the ship's logs that have all this information in it and plotted the map for me as well to show me where it happened. So they were really only days out from arriving in New Zealand. They had almost made it as a family. So for him to arrive at Wellington with his seven children and no mother to help him look after these children must have been huge. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a lot of upheaval anyway, coming all that way to New Zealand. But then to have that as well, that 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 is a huge complication in what was quite a difficult scenario anyway. It is. And to, to make matters worse, they hopped on a, a nine-seater bus, met them, to take them to where Adam was living, okay. which was outside of Wellington in a place called Pahiatua, which is near Featherston. And I'm led to believe that the farm wasn't perhaps as salubrious as it might have been made out to be. Oh, okay. And that the house itself wasn't that great and wasn't well lined and wasn't that wonderful. So I think it was pretty hard for them on their arrival as well with having to re-establish themselves. Yeah. And obviously the older children, the older daughter in particular, would have been expected to look after not only her father and probably her uncle, who was a bachelor, but also all these younger siblings. Yeah. So it was a difficult start. I bet. And unfortunately, Thomas, you know, he only had about 10 years in New Zealand and he passed away as well um, at the relatively young age of um, 52, which is another reason you want to understand these things because I know that in this particular line of my family, heart disease is not a friend to this family. No. And so understanding all of that through understanding the life story of what's happened to one of our ancestors is so important. Yeah, that is a very unfortunate end for presumably a voyage that started off with such great hope. Yeah, certainly is. And, you know, this family, they they went on, you yeah. know, everyone went on. The, the, the children all survived. They all married. They all have descendants. Yeah. Um, we've had a family reunion where we've all gathered together and, and chatted and talked to each other. Um, so it is good to see that, you know, we, we have survived. We have made it through some of these things that have been quite hard for us to actually get here and do. Um, to go from being a police constable to suddenly being a farm labourer must be pretty hard. <laughs> Slightly different work required on your body. So it's an interesting decision that is made when you don't necessarily have all the facts would there not have been a need for him to be some kind of police officer in New Zealand? Or I can guess there was an immediate need to be a labourer, but surely there must have need some kind of law in enforcement. Absolutely. But yeah, no, that never seems to have become part of his future in New Zealand. Okay. Uh, he was a farmer and a farm labourer for the whole rest of his life. I don't know whether he had not enjoyed police work. Um, that's a good question to ask. Absolutely. There is absolutely a police force. But yeah, he came out to work with his brother and work with his brother is what they did. Interestingly, his brother um, returned again to the UK just before World War II. Okay. Uh, the outset of World War II as well. And he actually also visited um, Europe at that time, managed to get on a boat to get out of the UK after the war had broken out went to Canada, visited the family in Canada on both directions of his voyage to the UK okay. and then came back to New Zealand and then re-enlisted. Perhaps telling a few fibs did Adam when he re-enlisted for World War II about exactly how old he was. <laughs> um, maybe made himself a little bit younger as well. 
And in fact, I think there's something in one of the records that say, you know, it's it's all very well that he wants to stay in, but actually we do know he's, you know, 60 and not the 50 or whatever he's trying to tell us he actually is. <laughs> so it's sort of like, good try. Yeah. <laughs> So he was he was very so, keen uh, to to sign up for that though, which he is, was yeah. So yeah, it, it's and it's interesting because I'm one. I, f- I feel like I'm one of few people that actually have direct ancestors who served in either war. Yeah. Um. None of my ancestors served, and I think that's predominantly because of age. They just happened to be the the wrong sort of half of the generation that missed it. Or most of them worked on farms. It's interesting when you just even sit down and, and look at those sort of things within your family. But I think the immigrant story for me is so strong because we all got here from somewhere. Um, and one project of talking about you know sharing family history I'm working on at the moment is exactly that, putting together just a short photo book of each of my immigrants that came to New Zealand with a little bit of information about what ship they came on and when they got here and what I've found so far and maybe who they came with, etc. Have you been able to go and visit their old home? I have been to Aberdeen once. Um, I have stood outside the door where they lived. Um, oh, wow. So that is really cool. Walking in the footsteps, there's nothing that beats that. <laughs> um, that ability to stand there and go, hey, you know, this is where my granddad came out the store and went to school. And, you know, I have his school certificates um, from Aberdeen. I have a school certificates from New Zealand. Um, all of those documents that are they're there, we just need to make sure we're looking after them and passing them on to the to the right person in the family to actually look after them and take them forward. Um, I have to say my, my big lockdown project amongst all of this was actually filing all the paperwork. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. I have lots of paper. So um, everything is now in files and folders. It's very important to do the admin. It is, and very important to find the next generation that's going to carry on for you. Um, And my daughter has now said that she won't just throw it out because now it's tidy. Good. (laughs) Well, thank you, Fiona, for sharing the story of Thomas Urquhart. But I think it's now time for you to face the brick wall. It's inevitable that you'll hit a research brick wall at some point in your research, regardless of how experienced you may be. Those missing, ambiguous or untranscribed records can provide a blocker for hours, days, years or seemingly forever. It's therefore time for my guests to share one of their brick walls in the hope that one of you, dear listeners, might just have a clue or a research idea that can help bring that brick wall tumbling down. So, Fiona. What have you got for us? Well, I thought I might start with another of my immigrants. Okay. And in this case, I thought we might jump to Jane Richardson. Okay. Now, Jane, the first thing I know about Jane is basically that she's getting married in Nelson in 1856, Nelson, New Zealand. Okay. I might have her 14 days beforehand because she fills in, we have documents called Intentions to Marry where you have to sign up and say, I want to get married to this person. Right, okay. And you are meant to tell exactly how long you've been in a district or a neighbourhood. Uh, and she says she's been in Nelson for 14 days, as her's her husband-to-be, Hector Matheson, or Hector MacDonald Matheson. Now, Hector has also been a brick wall. <laughs> let, let, let's face it, this whole couple really just did not want to be um, found out. Okay. Um. In New Zealand, our marriage records at this stage do not tell you who the parents of the bride and groom are. Okay, right. That's not helpful. Not helpful at all. So that's okay. It's 1856. She's getting married in Nelson. Now, they have some children together, but again, it's all happening before the 1870s, so there's not a lot of other information happening in those documents either. And then our friend Hector unfortunately dies. Oh. Now, he, he has been a brick wall because of the fact that no document in New Zealand actually has his parents' names on it. But I think I've gotten through his brick wall with the DNA because I'm making some connections to people in around the Glasgow area that would appear to come from one of his ancestors. Right, okay. So that's cool. So we'll leave Hector off to the side. We'll come back to Jane. Now, Jane does go off 
and after Hector dies, she does remarry. Fair enough. She remarries a guy called Henry Blunt Farquhar. Okay. But unfortunately, she married in 1874. So that little little gem of hope that you have that goes, hey, hopefully she might marry after 1880 when the marriage certificates change, died. So again, no parents on that document either. She could have waited. She could have waited. Surely they could have just <laughs> waited another six years so that they could produce a document that would help. So that's the way it sat for quite a long period of time. And I was working with another researcher actually to try and work this out and she had finally found the right death certificate I'd bought the wrong death certificate for Jane but she found the right New Zealand death certificate for Jane which you think oh cool it's a New Zealand death certificate these should have parents names on them Mm -hmm. so I look at Jane she dies in 1906 in Palmerston North which is on the North Island of New Zealand okay Um, you go to the parents column and it says name and surname of father Richardson. Name and surname of mother, Richardson. Uh, (laughs) Mother's maiden name, unknown. Father's occupation, unknown. Oh, Why did they even fill that in? (laughs) It's just teasing. It really is just teasing. Then you have a column that says, we're born and how long in New Zealand? And you think, well, this could work. So we're born does give me Glasgow. Okay. We've got an age that she is approximately 75 at this stage, so born maybe around 1833-ish, mm-hmm. um, based on how old she was when she married as well. So you, you've got a, a bit of a range on how old she was in some of these documents. Okay. But it also says that she'd only been 40 years in New Zealand, which means the person who was filling this in didn't know because 40 years only takes you back to 1866, and I know she was marrying in 1856. Right, okay. So... They don't necessarily know anything to an extent. They did know that she had children, so that's a good start. And they they vaguely got the age of the children right, and and they knew she had a first husband. Right. Also good, but not very helpful for getting me out of New Zealand and into Scotland. So I have looked for Jane Richardson's that maybe exist on the 1841 census. I have looked for Jane Richardson's that maybe exist in the 1851 census because I don't know what exactly what year she got here as to whether or not she was early into Nelson. Nelson's immigration was coming in around the 1840s if she'd actually arrived here and straight into Nelson. So she could have been an early arrival with parents. Right. Or did she come on a ship by herself? We do have lots of passenger records that have been digitised. Okay. I have not found her on any of those. We have lots of newspapers that have passenger lists in them as well. I have not found her in any of those. Although she could be in something called Richardson Family without any real, you know, names or anything to give detail to give that. So Jane is proving a little bit difficult at the moment to actually place somewhere. Yeah, no detail. And to find exactly when she came through. Now... You asked me to do this brick wall, so that that makes your brain start then actually ticking. And I started ticking on this brick wall, as you do. And I thought, I wonder what the chance of the children actually having any names connected back to her side of the family. If we're both Scottish, you know, if, if he's Scottish and she's Scottish, there is this thing floating back there called the Scottish naming pattern yep. that sometimes works. Good theory. Yep. Sometimes doesn't, but sometimes works. It's worth a shot to look at the children. It's worth a shot, yeah. And go, you know, do these children tell me anything? So the children have some middle names. Now, two of them have the middle name in McDonald. Not necessarily the most unique surname s- sticking around in Scotland. Yeah, so a few of those, yeah. One or two. And I think through the DNA, I now have a McDonald on Hector's side. Of the family. Okay. But one of their oldest child, Neil, who is my direct ancestor, has the middle name of Downey. So he spells it two different ways. He spells it D-O-W-N-E-Y and D-O-W-N-I-E. So there's this little part of me sitting there going, is that a surname connected to one of the parents. Will it be somebody's maiden name? Okay. 
And will I ever be able to prove <laughs> that the family <laughs> had a daughter called Jane that does not die in the UK or does not die in Scotland, which is basically what we look for for those of us in New Zealand when we're trying to trace someone. We're looking for people that their story ends without a death and their story begins on a timeline in another country as such. Yeah. And yeah, there's possibilities, but I've still got no proof. I mean, it's fairly common in my tree for these uh, slightly unusual middle names to actually be the names of the mother before the, her marriage or sometimes the grandmother name before marriage. But it's not always the case because I've got some that just kind of descend the tree for like 12 generations and I've gone right back to where it seems to arrive and I can't find anyone with that surname that's been inherited as a middle name. So uh, I know, but, uh, you know, when you're, when you're scrapping around for any clues at all, yeah, you'll go for anything. And she had a son with the second husband and she gave him the middle name of Richardson. Okay. So that's good because that was her maiden name. So she managed to do that for the, the second family as such. Did they do it for the first family? And then you start going, well, okay, did they did they really follow the, you know, the, the naming pattern with, you know, the first son after the father's father and the second son after the mother's father, in which case could be William Richardson. Okay. And a mother could be Mary because the first daughter was called Mary. But Mary's not a particularly uncommon name, and funnily enough, neither is William. No. So there's there's potential hints without there being any proof. So I would love it if people could actually manage to find my Jane Richardson from presumably Glasgow, but maybe just Scotland, knowing also that Glasgow is one of those hubs that people come from from throughout Scotland as well, just to be... <laughs> An extra added little bonus. That is true, yeah. Um, to find out if they can find her. And then maybe they might like to send me an email and they could send it to me at Memories in Time. So it's Fiona at memoriesintime.co.nz. You never know, maybe we'll be able to celebrate actually putting her in a time and a place and giving her a story of how she got here and who she left behind as well. That would be exciting if you could break this brick wall. So my fingers are crossed. Of course, listeners can also head over to familyhistoriespodcast.com where they can read this episode's show notes, or they can even send us an email on hello at familyhistoriespodcast.com. And of course, we'll pass that straight on to Fiona. Well, I think I can hear the, the listeners frantically scribbling notes. And whilst they do that... I think I might just be able to help you solve this. That would be cool. But you're going to need to follow me through to the garage. Okay, that sounds interesting. Here we are, one time machine. A time machine? Yes, don't tell anyone though. I don't want coach tours turning up or trip advisor reviews. Oh wow, this is going to be a game changer. Well, maybe, but there are rules. It can help untangle the odd mystery from time to time, as well as help avoid library book late fees. Now, I wondered whether you'd like oh, to... Oh, yes, please. Let's go. Let's go oh, now. Well, well, yes. Uh, if you'd like to just sit... Oh, yeah. Okay. Blimey. I better start powering it up then. Oh, now, hang on. Hang on. Can we go into the future as well as going back? Yeah, it can. But where's the fun in that? I hate spoilers. Well, you know, if we went into the future, we can see what records we don't have then because we've done something stupid now, and then we can save them. Hmm. I hadn't thought of that. However, this right now is just one trip back in time to see if you can solve that brick wall for yourself. Okay. So, remind me of where I'm sending you. As tempting as it is to go back to Scotland, let's go to the 9th of June 1856 in Nelson because I know she is there and she should be able to tell me who her parents are. Okay, we'll just uh, do a bit of fine tuning. Okay. What was that? What was what? I thought I heard you say something. No, but I was about to say that you'll need this. It's a temporal beacon. Keep it with you at all times and press the big button on the top when you're ready to come home. Okay, got it. Here we go. Fiona Brooker. Thank you, goodbye, and good luck. Oh, spot on.
Now, where's my scanner? I've got a 1931 England and Wales census to check on. The Family Histories podcast was presented and produced by me, Andrew Martin. My guest was the brilliant Fiona Brooker. And if you've enjoyed this episode, then thank you for listening. Why not share it with your friends, tell the world and tap that follow button to make sure you get the next episode. Approximately no family historians were harmed in the making of this podcast.